Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time to attend our Career Practice 101 info session. I will be the moderator for today's call. My name is Ozma Khan, and I'm a campus recruiter at Mercer. I recruit for the West Coast and Texas. Um, and on the call today, I am joined by my wonderful colleagues, Michaela Seward, uh, who covers the Central Region, as well as William Randall, who covers the East. A uh, few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we would love to see your beautiful faces, so feel free to keep your videos on if you choose. Uh, everyone's mics are currently muted, and we ask that you keep yourself on mute for the duration of the presentation portion. There will be time for Q&A um, at the end, um, and we encourage you to unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, and of course, you are um, always welcome to ask any questions in the chat box during the presentation and we will do our best to get those answered. Uh, if you have any recruiting related questions, process, eligibility, applications, et cetera, feel free to private message myself um, or one of the other recruiters on the call um, and we will do our best to answer those questions. Uh, following the presentation, we will reach out to all of you with additional Mercer resources along with um, information on future sessions plus the link to this recording. Additionally, in our follow-up email, we will share available opportunities with you along with instructions on how to apply. Now let's get this session started. We have some amazing speakers with us um, here today who are excited to speak with you about the career practice. Um, Andy, the floor is yours. I'll let you kick it off. Thanks, Ozma, and thank you to everyone for joining and you know, taking time out of your day to learn about our, uh, our career business. So, you know, the, the first slide here is uh, the agenda for today. So we'll go through, I'll give you an introduction in just a second about who I am and the teammates that I'm with. We'll tell you a little bit about Mercer and broader Marsh and McLennan companies who Mercer is a sister company of. And then we'll tell you about our, our career practice, which is the, uh, the group that Sarah, Anjali, and I work in. And then we'll give you a little bit more about roles and culture, what it means to work at our organization, the type of work we work on, example projects, things of that nature. So, you know, really excited to get, get started and I will go to the next slide here. So a little bit of introduction, I'll start. My name is Andy Campbell. I'm a, a principal consultant in our, our career practice, you know, lots of different terms. I've been with Mercer for about 10 years. I uh, started my career in the Philadelphia office and I'm now based in LA. Uh, started as an analyst in uh, 2010 and I'm a principal now. Um, my you know, main area of focus is really broad career, but I do a lot with rewards, talent strategy, incentive plan design. Um, and I wouldn't say I don't necessarily focus in any sort of industry, broad industry exposure. And one of the things I definitely like most about working at Mercer and career is you really get a lot of uh, different exposure. Sarah? Yeah, hey everyone. My name is Sarah Matheson. I'm a senior associate, um, also working in our Los Angeles office with Andy. I've been with Mercer for about five years and technically six if I include the internship that I did um, for, a few, for a few months um, during my junior year of, of college. Um, that inspired me to join full time and um, obviously stay here for the first five years of my career. Um, like Andy, I'm a generalist as well. Um, I focus across our areas. Um, uh, and our communities of interest, which you'll learn more about in this presentation. Um, but very excited to be here with you all today. Anjali, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anjali Kumar. Um, I'm a senior analyst in the LA office, just like these guys. Um, I graduated from USC with a BA in cognitive science, and I entered with Mercer in 2018 and accepted a full-time offer for 2019 onwards. So I've been with Mercer for about a year. And just like Andy and Sarah, I'm also a generalist. So um, my work areas span from anywhere from talent strategy to executive rewards to diversity inclusion, which we'll talk a little bit more um, in the next couple slides. Okay, so, you know, you know, overall, here's a little bit of background about in, of what Mercer is and how it fits into Marsh and McLennan companies. So MMC is, you know, global professional services firm with, you know, four different sister companies. You have Marsh, which is commercial insurance, insurance brokerage, and risk management. 
Guy Carpenter, which is reinsurance, which is essentially insurance for insurance. And then you have two consulting arms, Mercer and Oliver Wyman. And Mercer, you know, focuses in talent, health, retirement, investment, consulting, broken into three different groups of business, career, health, and wealth. And how, you know, we are within the career, career group. And we all focus in that area. And then Oliver Wyman is a strategy consulting firm, management consulting, similar to what Mercer does. Um, and we, you know, do projects with them oftentimes and collaborate on research. So really two parts of Marsha McLennan, the consulting arms and then the insurance arms. And so a little bit about, you know, Mercer. Mercer, Mercer is a, you know, part of the public firm MMC. We have a huge footprint, global 28,000 clients, uh, you know, between four and 5 billion in revenue, major history, um, in our financial space, we have a lot of assets under management. And, you know, the key point here being is we do a lot of work with the largest companies in the world and have a very global footprint. You know, some of these stats here, 80% of the for, uh, Fortune 100, 88% of the Fortune 500, 130 countries um, affecting, you know, indirectly touching the health, wealth, and um, career of 110 million in people with the work that we do. So drilling down into Mercer and what it is. So there's, there's the way that I think about it is there's two different components of Mercer. You have benefits related things, which are health and benefits consulting and investment and retirement consulting, and then non-benefits. And that's where workforce and careers in you know, our, our M&A practices. So Sarah, Anjali, and I sit on this right side of the page working on various things for, for folks within compensation, um, people strategy, uh, HR transformation, pay equity is you know, a buzzword that we do a lot of work with, um, employee and workforce analytics, um, and, and you know, various interesting projects that have um, major implications for the clients that we work with. Um, you know, the M&A Consulting Advisory Service is another, uh, another piece of work that we touch in on a, on a fairly regular basis. We're helping companies, if they're thinking about you know, acquiring a company or selling off with the, the due diligence and in integrating their people strategies um, between the two entities. So you know, a pretty diverse set of work and you know, just speaking personally, something that's kept me engaged the breadth of the work for the 10 years I've been here. And uh, I feel like I've learned new things every day. Um, you know, this is a standard kind of <laughs> slide that has the clients that we work Our with. Our bragging slide. The bragging slide, if you will. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of big names here. I think just me personally, this is for, you know, for all of, you know, Mercer career. Um, but, you know, I've worked with probably a third or half of these organizations in various different capacities over the 10 year I've been with the firm, which is, um, which is something I'm proud of and you know, uh, speaks to the, the breadth and the, the global footprint of the firm. And the three of us are biased as we're Los Angeles based. So you'll, you'll hear some of that in the call, but everything we've said so far and everything we'll talk about really does represent sort of the, the broader um, Mercer scale of uh, footprint and scale of impact. Um, so thanks Andy for that kind of overview. What we want to spend some time doing now is digging a little bit more into what specifically we do in career. And you've heard from what Andy shared, you know, we are a human capital strategy focused firm. So we focus on helping companies bring to life um, their people strategy and um, how they will make the most out of the workforce um, that they have to achieve their business objectives. We typically think um, and, and bucket the work that we do within career as in three, what we call communities of interest, um, talent, transformation, and executive. Um, you've heard Andy, Anjali, and I all mention that we think of ourselves as generalists. What that means is we do work across these areas um, regularly and our solutions for clients often integrate um, pieces of this puzzle in a lot of different formations um, to help our clients achieve their goals. Um, but, but some individuals and parts of our firm do specialize and become experts in maybe one of these core um, communities of interest. To give you a quick 
details, quick details on what they are. Um, so executive is really focused on how we support the top levels of leadership within organizations, um, often around um, compensation rewards and um, performance management, right? So when you think about the CEOs and the boards of directors um, for every, every company, every type of company out there from Fortune 100 to um, nonprofit organizations, um, companies need to be very strategic about how they attract, retain, and reward those executives. Um, and so we'll work on projects like um, designing incentive plans based on achieving performance goals or helping, helping board companies, boards of publicly traded companies um, to achieve um, sort of their goals in terms of how they review and justify and design pay um, for executive Team members. Uh, the second one I'll talk about is transformation. So this has been an increasingly busy and um, high growth portion of our business, which is focused on transforming the HR function specifically in companies and bringing it essentially into the future um, as companies face challenges with competitive workforces um, and, um, you know, the challenges in attracting and retaining and developing their talent. They need to rethink how the HR function works to support the business in meeting those strategic goals. Sometimes that's about technology implementation, so you'll see digital implementation listed there. Sometimes it's just about the strategy of how HR operates. And then there's also a key element of change management, right? So as companies revisit how their HR function operates, um, how do they make that change effective? Um, the last bucket is talent, and this really becomes almost a catch-all. Um, this is addressing a plethora of workforce-related issues that companies ask themselves um, to design and deliver the right people strategy for their employees. Um, so, you know, like I said before, they're separated into different buckets. A big portion, there's a big portion that we do in rewards. Um, and helping companies design the right, what we call employee value proposition for their employees. Um, we do work in the um, employee engagement space. So helping companies assess and understand um, their workforces and what their wants and needs and concerns are and addressing those. Um, a key element of that gets, uh, is particularly relevant today when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Um, and just, using essentially their their all of their data and their combining that with their business strategy to develop the right people approach to how they manage their workforces so that was kind of a a quick overview um i think the next slide if you want to flip um andy this is these are meant to be kind of a suite of what we offer right but where we really start when we talk to clients is what are the challenges that they're facing and we work to put together the right solution that will fit them based on the issues they're dealing with so some of these items listed here are are some key challenges that um, especially recently have become even bigger concerns or um, considerations for how they approach um, their their managing their workforce um, some examples I'll just pull out here, managing, demogra managing demographic shifts, right? So um, the millennial generation and you all, who I think are probably classified as Gen Z, um, have very different wants, um, expectations, desires in terms of your career um, path and, and um, what you want out of opportunities with the companies that you apply to and work for. And so helping companies understand that demographic challenge and create the right programs to attract and retain the demographic um, that they care about or that, that they want to, to um, retain to meet their objectives, that can be a really big strategic question that they're dealing with. Um, another big one would be the gig economy. Um, so this is a question that um, companies face as, um, you know, you all are familiar probably with the Lyfts and Ubers of the world and how they rely on a contract and gig economy workforce to um, manage their, to, to deliver their business model, right? And so companies are exploring ways that they can do that in their own business models as well. 
Um, another big one I'll touch on is just using data and analytics effectively, right? So there's tons of information that companies have related to their employee population, who they are, what their demographics are, what their experience and um, uh, capabilities look like. And so helping companies to harness the power of that to get real insights um, that will help them make data-driven decisions um, often becomes a big part of most projects that we do across that, com that scale of communities of interest. Um, I wanna tap into next, I think a couple of, of key terms that we keep using just to help bring the story together. Um, so on the next slide, um, just to, to provide a bit of an overview story, often with our clients, we'll start helping them identify what they're looking for by using something called a people strategy roadmap. Um, the solutions that we end up developing or designing for them may only may address a piece of this roadmap, but the biggest thing this conveys is that we start with number one, which is really honing in on the business strategy of the organization, what sort of external environment they're facing, and what risks and opportunities they're dealing with um, to achieve their business objectives. Based off of that, we can help them build the right people strategy. And this, this sort of flows into the next few steps of this map, right? So um, who are the people they need? What type of skills and jobs do they need in an organization? How do they segment those needs by most critical, um, but the most critical roles to just core roles that you need um, to deliver the day-to-day -day of your of your work. Um, how do they get those people, right? So number four, what do employees, the employees that they want actually value and how can we link that to um, what the employees um, see when they're looking for a job, when they're making decisions about their career and so on. Um, and then we dig into creating programs. So this is really about designing the right, another term we'll dig into a little bit, the right total reward strategy for these, for these, this workforce that the company is looking to achieve. Um, how, how companies design this strategy will differ widely based on how they want their workforce to shape up. Um, and then, you know, you could design the greatest pro pro programs in the world, but there are cost implications of those. So there's a huge piece of the work that we do that's about finding the balance between the um, strategy um, that, that they want to deliver and the cost impact of making those decisions. And so that will help us help, help the rubber hit the road when it comes to actually implementing and making these programs feasible. Um, and then, you know, in terms of taking this all together, it may be great to think that this is an A to Z process that a company can, you know, do one time and then uh, they're good to go. But the truth is, is that factors change every year. Um, this year is a great example of that and the challenges that our, that our clients are facing with everything going on with coronavirus, right? And um, we'll talk a little bit more about some case examples related to that later, but um, this is a constant, constant iterative process with our clients to hone in and continue to refine the people strategy that they need. Um, one more concept I'll dig into a little bit more on the next page is this concept of total rewards. So you've heard us talk about rewards being a big piece of the work that we do. So um, how, how companies decide to compensate their employees for their work. Um, and the obvious things that may come to mind are your salary, your bonuses, um, maybe even benefits, right? So if you flip to the next page, Andy, um, what we think of those as is, is a part of this triangle. Um, so this is, this is summarizing what total rewards means to Mercer, I guess you could say. So those basic salary, bonus, benefits lines, that's really what we consider to be a contractual piece of this equation. But there's really more to the employee experience and to, to, to what we consider a company's total rewards value proposition um, that has to do with experiential elements. So career and well-being. How well can I as an employee understand my career path in this organization? Um, can I see the route to how I can go from being an analyst to a director to CEO of the company if I choose to? 
um, and defining and helping um, communicate those paths is a huge part of the work that we do as well. Um, another angle is well-being, right? And, um, you know, we talk a lot about the phrase work-life balance is a buzzword in today's world. What that means has changed a lot, right? With people living and working at home and the experience that companies provide to promote the well-being of their employees and make them feel like the company they work for is the right fit for their work-life balance needs, that's a huge part of the experience as well. And then at the top of the period, pyramid is what we call sort of the emotional or purpose um, part of the proposition. Um, this is about getting your workforce in touch with your mission and, um, and being able to really convey and connect um, your workforce with what you want to achieve. And I think what's important to emphasize is this triangle can take very different shapes for all types of organizations. Um, a nonprofit might lean on that mission-driven side of what they achieve to attract the right people, you know, partially because of cost reasons, right? Nonprofits have less money and can't pay as high as salaries, but also because they want to attract individuals who are enthused and driven by that mission to achieve. Um, another organization might focus differently. So these are just part examples of the types of conversations and questions that we work with clients to address what the right fit, what the right strategy for them is, and then design what they need um, to, to really bring it to life. Um, I think that's kind of a, hopefully a good overview of the career package. So obviously we can answer some questions later. I think Anjali, you might take over next. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about less of the what is Mercer and more of the who we are, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. So yeah, as she mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what the roles at Mercer look like and what our culture sort of looks like. So looking at this slide, um, in terms of our culture, Mercer definitely has high expectations of our consultants. Um, but with that being said, there's no single type of person that we look for in a consultant or someone who we're trying to recruit from. Um, and as such, I think our team definitely speaks to that because it's filled with people from different educational backgrounds, um, different career backgrounds, and just people who have a wide variety of different interests. Um, but with that being said, there's definitely a few common attributes that I think we all really share. Um, this, namely, these include strong interpersonal abilities, um, being a good self-starter and someone who's really motivated and someone who has um, a strong technical skill set. So to speak a little bit on each of these, um, in terms of interpersonal abilities, what this means is essentially just someone who can work with a wide variety of people, can get along with a wide variety of people, who can be a strong communicator, both from a verbal as well as a written sense. Someone who's a team player um, and who just seems really engaged. Um, and these are typical, typical skills that you may have you know, already exercised in your um, infamous work um, or educational and um, school team projects that you may have been on. And um, then in terms of motivation, uh, what we mean by this is just someone who's a self-starter, um, someone who really engages in their meetings and contributes to um, any decisions that are made as part of their team, someone who has a willingness to learn, um, is asking effective questions, and is just in general um, shows that they have intellectual curiosity in whatever they're doing. And lastly, um, having a strong technical skill set. And what we mean by this is not necessarily someone who comes in with all the necessary analytical tools um, that are already developed, but rather someone who has um, just in general, a strong analytical mindset, someone's able, who's able to look at um, a large set of data and be able to extract a couple of key insights from there, um, looking at something and being able to view it from both a quantitative as well as quality, qualitative perspective and just being detailed oriented in general. So um, if we look at the next slide, we can also see that just like Mercer has high expectations of the consultant, our, its consultants, um, our consultants also have high expectations of Mercer. So this is essentially speaking to what Mercer can provide for you, which definitely varies from person to person. But um, here are some examples, including you know providing a strong team experience, um, learning opportunities, career growth, um, the ability to get involved in intellectual capital and so forth. Um, we also have a multi-project staffing model, 
um, which is something that I really enjoy. And what this means is, um, as opposed to other consulting practices where you may be staffed on one project for a longer period of time, at Mercer, you can be on anywhere from three to eight projects at a time, um, as an example. So what I like about that is that I get to, in simple terms, learn a lot really quickly. Um, I'm just, you get a lot of exposure to a wide variety of industries and practice areas um, that you wouldn't in other firms not necessarily so. Um, in addition to that, Mercer also is a global company, so you definitely get to experience some of the benefits of that um, by maybe participating in rotations on both a national as well as a global level, or maybe even rotations um, across lines of businesses. So that's a high level overview of that, but and, uh, Andy and Sarah, feel free to chime in if you have um, any personal anecdotes that you think speak to this more? Yeah, um, I, I'll chime in and, and I see the question in the chat as well um, related to the global reach. Um, Anjali, you covered it well, right? We are a international organization with offices in every, off in every big city you can think of um, and many small cities too. Um, and that's something that I was really attracted to because I was interested in you know, working for a global firm and having the opportunity to connect. Um, and so over my five years, not only have all of us worked on projects with global companies um, that have locations and others, so we're helping them solve international um, workforce questions and so on, um, but I also have a couple opportunities. Um, one, I had the chance to go rotate um, to our Hamburg, Germany office for two months um, and work with their team um, which is really neat and um, you know only a, a few years into my um, work experience with Mercer which is really cool um, to collaborate with them and get to know them and um, I've also you know being a global business we have a lot of um, intellectual capital and global kind of points of view that we want to pull together to um, sort of act as a framework for our organization no matter what country we're in and so i had the opportunity to work with what we call our global business solutions team in a rotation last year um, where i spent a year um, with 50 percent of my time working with an internal global um, consulting team um, with uh, folks i think i was in every time zone at one point or another um, did involve some early morning calls but being really fo our focus was on how um, will Mercer help organizations um, address questions of the workforce for the future, right? How will they um, take digital transformation and the development of new technologies and really use that to enable and move their uh, workforce into the next generation? So not only did I meet a lot of um, global consultants through both of those experiences, I was able to work out of our Hamburg office and also um, visit Sydney as well. Um, as that was where one of my core coworkers um, was on that project. Awesome, thanks, Sarah. So moving on to the next slide, um, since we touched a little bit more about Mercer's culture, um, we can start to get into what the different roles are at Mercer and how your role expands. So as the title suggests, um, at Mercer, your role is always expanding. And what that means is a day in the life of an analyst is gonna look drastically different than um, from a day in the life of a principal or partner. So at the analyst or senior analyst level, um, your main priority is essentially just absorbing as much as you can and focusing on learning. And in terms of the work that you're doing, it's primarily you know, gathering and analyzing data and seeing what sorts, of, what sorts of insights you can gather from that and how you can use that to inform any recommendations that you and your team come up with. Um, you're doing a bit of everything, but it's still at the early stages. And then as you sort of grow into the role and maybe are promoted to an associate, the associate will still be you know, somewhat close to the data, but they'll start to maybe start reviewing other people's work on the team and start to think about project management and moving a little bit away from doing, you know, just kind of the data analysis and thinking about how that can be utilized um, in a more holistic view of the project. Um, and then at the senior associate level, this one, this role is often dubbed one of the most difficult roles at Mercer because, as you can see from the visual, um, the scope of the work is definitely the largest. Um, you're still, you know, focused on ensuring that the data is accurate um, and that you can use it to, you know, you're, you're thinking, considering 
what recommendations you can draw from that. Um, you're also really heavily managing projects or mo modules and you're starting to prepare proposals and manage accounts, um, thinking about you know, how to best um, engage with our clients to ensure that their needs are being met um, and that our relationships are um, remaining intact and growing. Um, and then lastly, at the principal and partner level, um, here you're you know, more focused on um, the high level strategy of the project and thinking about how best to advise the client and how to help implement our proposals and solutions. Um, you're also focused on you know, directing sales and engagements and um, thinking about new ways to incorporate you know, thought leadership and cutting edge uh, market research to um, our projects and seeing how to you know, initiate and commercialize those efforts. And one, one thing I'll, and thanks, Andre, one thing I'll add is, you know, as I mentioned before, is I, I started as an analyst and am now a principal and, you know, so the upward, upward mobility is definitely a thing at Mercer and, you know, what's kept me engaged is really at every kind of step of the way I've felt challenged, like I was outside of my comfort zone. And that's really what has been so engaging for me and, you know, made it such a valuable career at the same time. Yeah, and I'll just chime in my two cents too. I think one of the neat things, again, contributing to my engagement and staying at Mercer um, so long has been from the first day, you are getting exposure to um, the, the highest level and most strategic discussions that we have with our clients. So whether it's just listening in on a client call to start or being involved and in ask your opinion and brainstorming session, um, there's a lot of, of focus and energy on giving everyone the chance to learn and and um, contribute and um, grow through um, those those interactions that really push you to challenge yourself to not just be a minion in an Excel file, um, but but much more than that. Definitely. And I think also just speaking more towards that Mercer's culture is very much so oriented towards you grabbing the opportunities that you want to. So um, even though that this, this visual is up here, um, it doesn't mean that your role is siloed um, within the confines of what these like different colored bars are showing. Um, if you want to do more management as an analyst, you're definitely encouraged to do so. That's just something that um, you need to you know, seek out if that's something that you're interested in. All right, so moving on to the next slide, um, beyond consulting, there's many other opportunities to get involved. Um, so speaking to what's on this page, we have business research groups, which are similar to like a club or an on-campus organization that you guys may be familiar with. Um, and these are basically groups comprised of you know, Mercer folks who can work together both locally within their offices as well as globally to um, advance causes they have an interest in, uh, like diversity inclusion, mentorship, and volunteering. And we'll touch a little bit about some of the BRGs that we have in place um, in a bit. But moving on to the other ways to get involved, um, we have recruiting teams in every office that um, help manage the process of recruiting, like you know, hosting events such as this one, um, engaging with interested applicants, um, you know, managing processes of rev resume reviews and interviews and whatnot. But with that being said, um, despite the fact that there are these dedicated recruiting teams, all Mercer consultants um, at any level are really encouraged um, to get involved in the recruiting process because we want all of our consultants to have a, a, a say in what the future of our team looks like. And then lastly, the training and development team. This team is really important because they coordinate and manage and develop all the program materials that are used to help consultants at any stage of their career. Um, and this is generally geared towards, you know, consultants who are onboarding as well as just all of us in the general Mercer population who are interested in continuous professional development um, materials that include anything from, you know, technical capabilities like Excel or R to um, other capabilities like presentation skills, project management, business development, and so forth. So looking at the next slide, um, I touched a little bit about BRGs already, but we just wanted to include this to kind of give you guys a bigger picture of what BRGs we have in place right now. As you can see, there's quite a bit. We have um, 
a rising professionals network, RPN. We have um, a racial and ethnic diversity BRG, um, Mercer Cares, which is a philanthropic BRGs, and all these BRGs um, host different events throughout the years, uh, every single year. So Mercer Cares, for example, this is a philanthropic um, focused BRG, and every year they host a lot of really fun events. Um, uh, one year we, every year we take off like a day from work and we go volunteer at a local nonprofit, um, which is in that picture on the bottom left right there. But yeah, all these energies, um host a lot of events and they also have internal meetings throughout the year. And if you have an interest that isn't represented on the slide or isn't in a current BRG, then you're more than welcome to um, find other people who are interested in maybe spearhead efforts to develop a new BRG. So don't feel like these are the only um, BRGs that are available um, for you to join by any means. Something that's also really um, impactful for me in terms of um, what these BRGs mean to our organization, um, not only are they great um, communities and places for individuals to get, get connected, um, get resources, learn and participate, but they also connect very closely with a lot of questions that our business is working on for clients, right? So, um, for example, um, when it comes to um, racial and ethnic diversity and all of the important conversations that are happening um, about addressing systemic racism in our country, um, this has been um, something that we, of course, are working through internally as, at Mercer um, to help address. but that our clients are coming to us with questions about as well. And so from leveraging the knowledge and the community that's been built through our BRGs, we've been able to bring um, that to connect with what we're doing with our clients, um, both tactically by, by developing solutions um, that, that will help address our client needs, um, but also just, you know, strategically and in, in, you know, living what we, living what we preach, right, to our clients as well. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So now that we've touched on a little bit more about, you know, what Mercer does, and hopefully you have a better, better, better picture about what a day in the life looks like and what our sort of culture is, um, we thought we could provide you with some project examples um, just to give you a bit more insight on what an actual project looks like. So I can go first. Um, I'll talk about a project that I'm actually still currently on, but it's winding down. So I'm in the final stages of it. And I've been on it for about a year now. So this project is a global leveling project for a large pharmaceutical company. Um, the company has its main businesses in China and the US. And in China, their business is very well established. Um, whereas in, in the US, their business is significantly smaller, but at the same time, it's rapidly growing. So as the US business was growing, um, our client recognized that there were some inconsistencies in the way that the US and China businesses were structured. Um, and they wanted to find if there was a way to achieve global alignment, um, meaning having just one global consistent structure that they could adhere to um, as the U.S. business evolved and growed, and as they potentially considered branching out into new regions in the future. Um, so what I mean by strapping a clear global structure is just essentially having um, a consistent framework for objectively um, assigning values to positions uh, within their organization. So they engaged Mercer um, to do this project, and that's where um, I come in the picture. So I worked with my project team um, to develop a couple different work steps um, in order to help them achieve their goal. And um, we started off just trying to figure out what their current state looked like. So we conducted several different interviews with their leadership team to get a sense of how their current structures look like, um, what their promotions were based on, um, how many different levels or tiers they had in their organizations, um, and so forth. And from there, we um, took a look at their current inventory of jobs, and we evaluated a large set of these jobs um, by looking at the requirements or the scope of the job so we could understand um, the different relativities between the jobs. And what I mean by that is essentially we wanted to be able to say, um, for example, like a senior director in biostatistics um, has more, a larger scope of responsibilities than a senior director of biostatistics in, in the US. 
So we wanted to be able to kind of understand what the relativities were. And we also calibrated our evaluations with the business leaders or the functional leaders. Um, so we set up multiple different calls with the functional leaders so that we could understand their input on what the roles really are and um, how they compare with one another on a function by function basis. And ultimately through all of our you know, data analysis and interviews and um, working with uh, the client within both regions, um, we used our, uh, the results that we gathered to draft our proposal, which was essentially crafting a go forward global leveling structure that helped, um, that's gonna help align the two businesses and support their talent strategy. So that's, I know it was a lot to <laughs> kind of digest, but that's a um, project that I've really enjoyed working on um, in the past uh, almost a year now. So that's kind of one area that Mercer focuses on and a potential project that you, know, you might uh, have the opportunity to work on. So I think Andy or Sarah, if you guys wanna chime in and you know, talk a little bit about projects or a project that you're interested in or have worked on recently. Sure, uh, thanks Anjali. So uh, you know, a project that I have is, is, is a, like a, a very current issue that a lot of clients are going with, what Sarah mentioned earlier with uh, COVID-19. So we are engaged with a Fortune 200 biotech company that came to us and said, you know, it's very clear, you know, our findings, we found our employees that they like a preference in flexible work arrangements. And, you know, obviously this is a, a point in time where there's a lot of change happening in the world and a lot of people are going through some tough times, but we want to use this as a moment to create a flexible work strategy that will kind of dovetail into the future of work going forward. But we want to use this, this opportunity as a springboard. And, you know, our, our objective is to be a, a flexible work leader. And so a lot of that is just, you know, an example is, is a very broad kind of objective. And, and what does that really mean? You know, when people think about flexible work, it's often like the where and, and the when do you work? Where is it in office or is it in or is it remote and when is it certain hours, but there's much more to it than that. It's like what 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 are you doing what who who is doing it and various different things. And so we were engaged and came up with a, a plan to, you know, really three stages. It was discover kind of what you know flexibility meant for this organization. So what that what that meant is we put out various different employee surveys and found how can jobs flex within the organization and how do they have the ability to flex. So it's really deconstructing every job at this organization and figuring out, okay, how can this change going forward? And our, our role as consultant was to push their thinking for the executive leadership team because as I mentioned before, their third objective was to be a flexible work leader. So they wanted to be on the cutting edge. Um, you know, the second, the second part of the project was design. So it's, it's one thing to come up with an idea, but it's to put a process in place of how you're going to execute that design. And the third was, you know, I didn't mention this before, is, you know, the U.S. was a test case before um, in what we're working on now, but the idea is then to bridge it out and make it more global and apply it to different countries as well. And so, you know, can't share too much about the kind of what's going on with that specific project as it's in, you know, the, the early stages, but it's an example of, our clients coming to us with, you know, big, broad questions that, you know, they look to us to be their, you know, expert advisors and partner with them to figure out some complex uh, situations. Well, I'll, I'll go last and I'll try to keep it short so we can get to some of your questions. Um, I love this question though, and I always get excited slash stressed about choosing my favorite. So I'm gonna cheat and talk about three at the same time. Um, which are the three that are my most active projects right now, actually. And what has happened is all three clients are looking for a very similar solution um, in that they are focused on better defining and understanding the different jobs and levels of jobs in their organization, um, taking that kind of structure and building and understanding what career development looks like for employees in those roles and then linking compensation to that as well, right? So how do we pay individuals at each of these levels in the organization? Um, and so on paper, there's actually a kind of a similar project that I'm working on with three different organizations. But one of those organizations is a very small, well-known not-for-profit aquarium. Um, this, the 
Second one is a very high growth pre-IPO um, electric, electric vehicle startup. And the third is a Fortune 200 massive organization um, focused uh, public, publicly traded healthcare um, organization. And what's been really interesting about doing those three at the same time is you see how different the solution is evolving for each of them. So they're, each type of organization is facing very different business challenges, both naturally by what they do as a company and also um, impacted by what's happening in our world today with coronavirus. Um, they also are facing um, you know, different types of urgency. Um, so that, that electric vehicle company I talked about, when I say high growth, I mean very high growth. And they are just trying to build a structure that will be able to flex as they scale super rapidly over the next, um, the next year. Um, and so by experiencing all this project together, um, it ties back to what we were talking about before about how um, how different and thoughtful organizations should need to be about their people strategy and about tailoring it to meet the needs of their employees um, to be successful. So um, that's all I'll say on that. Um, but I could give 80 other examples over my five years of projects that have been really unique and interesting to work on, which is cool. Um, Max, I know you've been answering some questions in the chat and Ozma as well. Are, are there any that, you know, it would be helpful for us to address live here with our last 12 minutes or if anybody else um, wants to ping new questions as well. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. The, oh, sorry, go ahead, Osman. Oh, go ahead, Max. Go ahead, Max. I was just going to say, I think uh, someone had also uh, asked about exit opportunities in a way from Mercer, like kind of, oh, how long do people stay at Mercer? And if they do leave, where do they go? And a very sort of case by case question, but maybe, uh, you know, Sarah, you and Andy and Anjali can kind of give a little bit uh, of an idea on tenure based on your experience. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Mercer is a consulting company, and I'm sure if many of you are interested in consulting more broadly, you've heard different stories of, you know, what a career path looks like in consulting, where it could lead. Um, and things like that. So one thing that I do think is unique, and when I was going through the process of recruiting, like many of you may be um, for consulting broadly, um, Mercer has this really great focus on a long-term career path um, and an opportunity to stay with a company like Andy did, from analyst to principal to partner and so on. Um, and, and many, and there are, uh, you know, a section of our consultants that spend their whole careers here. Um, there's also, you know, many individuals who don't, right? And, and so you can choose your own adventure, but from day one, um, you are treated and given the opportunity and learning and the training and the picture to see how you could stay your entire career if you wanted to. Um, in terms of where people do end up going who do leave, which there are, of course, um, people who do, um, there's a lot of, um, folks who might exit, um, as is common with consulting to other, um, higher education programs, so um, lots of business school, um, some law school, um, all, I, you know, I won't brag, but highly ranked ones, if that's, if that's what you're uh, thinking about, right? And, and um, Mercer set folks up for very successful paths into that kind of thing. Um, there's also very easy exit opportunities often, or I won't say easy because don't leave, uh, but uh, <laughs> We do create um, great HR talent internally in organizations, so um, often um, that can be a path as well. Um, one of the biggest concerns that I actually had coming into Mercer was, gee, if I go to an HR consulting firm, is all I'm ever gonna be able to do HR? And um, I actually expressed this towards the end of my internship. Um, and I was able to you know, connect with Mercer alumni actually that were still part of um, just kind of the network of, of the relationships that are made at Mercer and talk to them about, gee, what all have they gone off and done? And the, the range was huge. So straight into different strategy and operations roles, um, into all sorts of different industries, education um, and tech and all, anything you can kind of dream up in terms of those different opportunities. So um, like any consulting firm, really, Mercer really does set you up for lots of lots of exit opportunities in that way. Anjali, Andy, anything to add? 
Yeah, I would say, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I've been here my entire career. And just as an example, so I started in uh, as an analyst with five uh, or four other folks. Two of us are still with the organization. One of one person went to uh, to get their MBA after three years and went uh, went back to a different consulting firm. And that's OK. Uh, and then one of <laughs> the is in corporate strategy in the tech industry and another person started their own business in the UK. So it is a very broad uh, group in, of experiences. And, you know, I'd say one of the, the positives and kind of this is parlaying into the, the multi-project staffing model is you get exposure to a lot of different industries and a lot of different companies very quickly um, as uh, when you start your career. So to the extent that you're thinking about your own career, you have a better idea about what certain jobs look like, what certain companies look like, not necessarily specific company companies, but just an idea of how it works in different industries. So, you know, you just get very broad exposure and a lot of it quick. And that's a, a testament to the multi-project staffing. Max, any oh. other questions? <laughs> I think I had a few for you guys that I yeah, always one might have a few. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the three of you said that you're mostly generalists. What decisions led you to becoming a generalist with Mercer? Um, how would you become a, a specialist through your Mercer experience? Um, so, uh, I, or uh, Anja, you want to take it? Yeah, I, I'm sure. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I was going to say that. Um, from my perspective, so I'm a senior analyst, so I've been with Mercer for about a year. Um, when you join, um, you're really encouraged to kind of just, you know, soak up as much information as possible and to reach out and, and grab any opportunities um, that are span all of our different practice areas. That way you can kind of understand what Mercer has to offer, what the different projects look like and get exposure that way, rather than coming in with a set interest. With that being said, there's obviously opportunities for you to reach out to, you know, our staffing manager and see um, if you have an interest in like M&A or, you know, pay equity, um, reach out to that, um, whoever the staffing manager is to see if you can, you know, get more experience in that area. But from an analyst or, you know, someone who's just early in their career, um, we're really encouraged to um, try and, you know, get staffed on all different types of projects before honing in on a specific interest that we may have. Um, but maybe Andy and Sarah can speak to um, why they're a generalist after, you know, being <laughs> company for um, a bit of and, a longer time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There, I mean, there's never a moment where you suddenly have to decide, will I be a generalist or will I be a specialist? Um, it, it's often driven, like Anjali said, by your own interests. Um, so an example might be um, folks who um, come from a finance background or are particularly interested in um, that kind of side of things might focus in our exec, um, executive um, community of interest because Oh, Sarah, we lost you. Maybe we wait for her to come back or I can move on to the next question. We only have a few minutes left. Yeah, I mean, I'd just to, I think add to what, what Sarah was saying was, is there's the company, the, the firm, the goal is to push people to be generalists when they come in. And there's infrastructure in place with what Anjali mentioned with the staffing manager that, you know, you work with your, with your manager, your people manager and staffing to make sure that you're getting broad exposure to different projects. And Honestly, there'll be a little bit of a challenge if you come in and say, I only want to work on this because the goal is to make you a, a better consultant that can deliver across the firm. And so, you know, that's the type of people that we're really looking for is people that are curious in multiple different areas, especially when you come on as a, you know, an intern or, or an analyst. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Okay, so here's a good one. Um, how has COVID-19 affected your organization um, and your interaction with clients? We miss each other. <laughs> Sorry, that was weird. But, but no, really, I mean, one of the cool things about Mercer um, as a consulting company is that we um, are primarily a non-travel organization. So we will work um, in office most of the time traveling to client meetings um, regularly. So we might especially go locally once a week or 
I would probably had before the virus um, would be traveling to another state maybe once a month um, for visiting a client for a meeting. Um, but I love that in office um, energy. And so it has been tough because we don't get to be in the same place um, right now. Um, but I think, you know, off of that, you know, Mercer's done well and um, done their best in this crazy time to, you know, enable us internally, right, with the tools we need and the ability to still stay connected and all of that stuff. You know, the good news about consulting is it is not necessarily a, um, uh, a job that's challenging to do from a distance. We can still deliver um, to our clients. I think probably where the bigger impact has been is with our clients um, in that we, they're now coming to us asking us very different questions um, than they have in the past. Or maybe we're doing the same type of work, um, but we have to think about it from this new angle of a remote workforce, um, for example. Um, and Andy's project uh, example was like a great, a great, you know, perspective on that, right? And of a company that is now trying to, you know, turn this into something permanent and strategic to give their workforce a better, um, a better experience. Um, I don't know, Andy, Anjali, anything to add? Yeah, I would say that it's, you know, it, it has definitely changed the way we interact with clients where we would go, we would visit them for meetings and just, you know, speaking like, you know, on Zoom and whatnot. But I think that is, it's really just accelerated the trend that was happening before. I mean, as we've talked about before with, you know, the traditional consulting model is you go on site for four days, four or five days a week, you're sitting in an office at, at the client's site, and that is just the, the norm. And I'd say that, you know, this, you know, COVID-19 in, in this remote work is going to change that model pretty substantially going forward. So in a sense, I'd say that, you know, Mercer and our model is a little bit more, you know, progressive in, in um, from that perspective. And, you know, we're, we have a, to a certain degree, a leg up on, you know, kind of working on multiple different things with, you know, outside of our day to day on the client side. Now that's not to say that we don't do that when things are normal. We do spend a lot of time with our client if that's what they want. And, but I, what I would say is one of the findings is, is I think our clients are finding, you know, in, in generally speaking here, that that isn't necessarily what they, they want. Yeah, I'll just add that. I think this is uh, speaking to a little bit more what Andy was saying about how this is impacting the future as well from um, a go forward perspective. Our office is going to look different. Um, and I think a lot of that is going to be, you know, good changes earlier before, you know, all of us would come in um, different times. I would come in like five days a week, but I think this is definitely going to make an impact in terms of, you know, the work flexibility. Maybe there's an opportunity to come only two, three times a week um, because we're understanding that it's not maybe necessary to come in every single day. Um, all right. I think we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, unless there are some last minute burning questions, uh, we can wrap up. Thank you everyone today um, for joining the call. You guys are a very interactive group. Uh, I know everyone has enjoyed uh, speaking with you. Uh, as a follow-up um, reminder, we will be sending out more information. Um, so uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you in the future. Thank you again for joining. Everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.